Storm Warriors by Elisa Carbone. Selection illustrated by James Ranson. It's 1896 on Pea Island, part of North Carolina's Outer Banks. Nathan dreams of becoming a fearless surfman with Pea Island's elite African-American life-saving crew. However, his father, a fisherman, doesn't want Nathan to risk his life rescuing people from shipwrecks. Nevertheless, Nathan studies medical books and learns critical life-saving skills. Then a hurricane hits the Outer Banks. The E.S. Newman runs aground in the storm. This is Nathan's chance to help the surfman. As the storm rages, he begins to realize that knowledge is as important as bravery. I stumbled forward and caught my balance on the side of the beach cart. I faced the sea and the wind. There was the sunken ship, hardly 30 yards from us. She was a mass of dark hull and white torn sails against the foaming sea, rocking on her side. Her cabin and much of her starboard already demolished by the heavy surf. As I stood with my mouth open, panting, the wind blew my cheeks floppy and dried my tongue. A cheer went up from the sailors aboard the ship. They'd spotted us and had high hopes that they would soon be rescued. I expected to hear the command, action, to begin the breach's boy rescue, but heard nothing. It took me a moment to realize what Keeper Etheridge must have already figured out. Our equipment was useless. There was no way to dig a hole for the sand anchor under those rolling waves. Nowhere to set up the Lau gun. That's when I heard Mr. Meekin's voice above the din of wind and surf. Those waves won't stop me from swimming through them. They're all blown over, hardly taller than a man, he said. Swim? Swim out into that raging sea? I stood rigid and watched as Mr. Etheridge pulled a large-sized shot line out of the beach cart and helped Mr. Meekins tie it around his waist. Mr. Pugh was tied in as well, and the heaving stick, attached to its own line, was secured to Mr. Meekins' body. The wind shoved at me and buffeted my ears. It was unthinkable what these men were doing. Violence swirled around us, a deadly churning mix of wind and sea, and these two surfmen were walking into it. Man the ropes, shouted Mr. Etheridge. One of them goes down, we'll haul them both back in. Mr. Meekins and Mr. Pugh were dark forms against the white foam, plodding into the surf. Powerful waves smacked them in the chest. They ducked their heads down and pushed forward. I watched with a sick feeling in my stomach as the realization crept over me. I would never be able to do what these men were doing. The words and their motto ran through my head. You have to go out, but you don't have to come back. In that moment I knew, with not a shred of doubt, that I did not have the courage to risk my life that way. The dream, and all the months of hoping, blew away as quickly as the foam off the waves. William and Floyd and Daddy were right. I would never be a surfman. There was no time for me to wallow in my loss. The men were paying out the ropes, and I was a fisherman, here to help. I took hold of one of the ropes. I turned my face sideways to the wind, but still it made my eyes blurry with tears. Blindly, I let the rope out, hand over hand, then squinted out toward the ship. A ladder had been lowered, and the sailors leaned over the side, waiting. Mr. Meekins and Mr. Pugh were almost there. I heard another cheer from the men on the ship. When I peered out, Mr. Meekins was swinging the heavy stick and line. He let it fly, and it landed on deck. The sailors would tie the line to the ship so that the rope could help steady the surfmen as they made their way from the ship to the shore and back again. Soon we were hauling rope back in. The surfmen would be carrying one of the sailors between them now. I squinted into the spray. Where was the rescued sailor? Mr. Meekins and Mr. Pugh were on their way back, but without a third man between them. Mr. Meekins was carrying something a little larger than a tile gun. What in the world could be more important to save off that ship than the lives of the men on board? I shook my head and hauled rope. The surfmen were half walking, half swimming, pushing forward, 
the waves smacking against their backs and seeming to want to spit them out of the sea. As the surfmen drew closer, I heard what sounded like the squalling of an alley cat. Mr. Meekins handed over his bundle and shouted, Get it into dry blankets before it goes blue! The bundle was passed from man to man until it was handed to me, and I found myself looking into the terrified eyes of a screaming child. Daddy put his arm around my shoulders. The driving cart, he shouted over the din of the waves and the wind. In the driving cart, which was nothing more than an open wagon, dry blankets were packed under oil skins. We crouched next to the cart and gave us some protection from the storm. The child clung to my neck. He was drenched and shivering miserably. I tried to loosen his grip so I could get his wet clothes off, but he just clung tighter. He was crying more softly now. Mama? He whimpered. I gave Daddy a pleading look. What if his mother had already been washed overboard and drowned? Daddy stood, cupped his hands around his eyes, and looked in the direction of the ship. They're carrying a woman back now, he said. Your mama is coming, I told the child. He looked to be about three or four years old, with pale white skin and a shock of thick brown hair. Let's get you warm before she gets here. We had the boy wrapped in a dry blanket by the time his mother came running to him, cried, Thomas, and clutched him to her own wet clothing with such passion that she probably got him half drenched again. The lady, who told us her name was Mrs. Gardiner, said she'd been warm enough in her wet dress under blankets and oilskins. No sooner had we settled her with Thomas than we heard the cry, Oh, this man is injured! I ran to sea. A young sailor had just been delivered by the surfman. Blood dripped from his head and stained his life preserver. His lips were a sickly blue. He took two steps and then collapsed face first into the shallow water. Mr. Browser dogged him by his armpits and pulled him toward the driving cart. George, take over my place with the ropes, he shouted to Daddy. Nathan, come help me. The sailor looked hardly older than me, with dirty blonde hair that had a bloody gash the size of a pole beam running through it. Treat the bleeding first, then the hypothermia. I said as I recalled the words from the medical books, and they comforted me with their matter-of-factness. Mr. Bowser grunted as we lifted the sailor into the driving cart. You did study well, Nathan, he said. Mr. Bowser sent me for the medical chest, then I held a compress against the man's head wound while Mr. Bowser began to remove his wet clothes. That's when Mr. Bowser seemed to notice Mrs. Gardner for the first time. Ma'am, we're going to have to, he cleared his throat. <clears> throat> This boy is hypothermic, so his wet clothes have to. Mrs. Gardner rolls her eyes in annoyance. Oh, for heaven's sakes, she exclaimed. She immediately went to work to pull off the man's boots, help Mr. Bowser get the rest of his clothes off, and bundle him in a dry blanket. Are there any other injured on board? Mr. Bowser asked as he wrapped a bandage around the man's head. No, only Arthur, she said. He took quite a fall when the ship ran aground. Arthur groaned and his eyes fluttered open. I'm cold, he complained. Suddenly there was a commotion at the ropes. Heave, Mr. Etheridge shouted. Haul them all in. They've lost their footing, I cried. Mr. Bowser grasped me by the arms. Take over here. I'm sure you know what to do. Then he ran to help with the ropes. My hands felt clammy and shaky, but once again the words from the books came back to steady me. Rub the legs and arms with linseed oil until warmth returns. I rummaged in the medicine chest, found the linseed oil, and poured some into my palm. This will warm you, sir, I said loudly enough to be heard over the wind. Arthur nodded his bandaged head and watched nervously as I rubbed the oil onto his feet and calves, then his hands and arms. He gave Mrs. Gardner a quizzical look. Ain't he young to be a doctor? he asked her. She patted his shoulder and smoothed the hair off his forehead. He seems to know what to do, dear, she said. I am warming up, he said. I lifted the lantern to look at Arthur's face and saw that his lips were no longer blue. <laughs>
Just then, a tall white man appeared, dressed in a captain's coat, his long hair flying in the wind. He reached up into the driving cart and pulled Mrs. Gardner to him, pressed his cheek against hers. He must have asked about Thomas because she pointed to him, bundled and sleeping in the cart. They've saved the whole crew, he cried. He looked around at me and Arthur and at the other rescue sailors and the surfmen who were now gathered around the driving cart in preparation for the long trip back through the storm to the station. My good men, he said, his voice shaking, we owe you our lives. <laughs>